Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, all. Thank you for attending this webinar. Um, we're gonna just uh, do a little housekeeping. This session is recorded and it will be shared with the participant as well as the presentation. All the microphones of the attendees are muted. We're gonna have two poll sessions during this uh, webinar. You can submit your answers um, in a, uh, you have a, would you will have about 30 seconds to submit your answers. And at the end of this session, we'll have a Q&A with our panelists. You can enter your questions in the right, uh, on the right side of your screen in the question uh, section. And now our Director of Flight Operations, Stuart Fox. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the uh, second in a series of this tech, op tech Operationals webinar. Art has been running a series of these webinars, and they've been very popular. I'm glad you can really join us today. Um, so um, what's it all about? Well, to put it into context, you can see on the slide there, hopefully, the developing situation the industry faced, which really kind of kicked off in March. Um, basically, at the end of um, 2019, um, there was roughly 30,000 aircraft uh, active and around about 3,000 of those were parked up um, for whatever reason. Uh, in, in April of this year, we noted that there's roughly 18,000 aircraft parked up. Um, and you can see on the, the bar chart there, that's a huge number of aircraft. Gradually since April, it's been improving. And we noted there was a little over 18,000 in May it's down to about 16, sorry, 12,000 in um, June. So that's around about a 30% uh, uh, increase in aircraft being used. That's good news for us. Well, what's, what's it meant for the industry? Well, I remember in, in March um, responding to, I think, uh, no time about every few minutes with airspace closing. Physical distance measures were introduced, which meant it's very difficult for um, people to travel, therefore to do audits, uh, to train the staff, uh, the supply chain was broken, so the impact on the industry was significant. Uh, we've been very fortunate though because um, very, very quickly we realised there's a huge problem here and not only us but our stakeholders, for example ICAO, we got together with, our, um, with ICAO and other organisations and uh, actively, proactively looked at putting in measures which could help the industry to do that. Um, so utilization wise, aircraft at the end of 2019 were being used for about nine hours per day on average. That's reduced down to five hours a day. It would have increased a little bit now. I think in, in uh, July, the last stats we saw was six hours a day in June, so that's good news. Um, the aircraft are parked all over the place. Uh, we reckon in about 180 countries um, or in all different parts of the world. And what does that mean? It means the aircraft parked up still have to be maintained, still going to be serviced, and it requires maintenance programs to be put in place. And you probably realise, but IATA are devoted to uh, serving our members during the crisis and for the restart and return to service. And this is what this webinar is really about, is the return to service. So can we just switch to the next slide, please? So the agenda today uh, is focused on that. Uh, we do have um, legal counsel representing us today, uh, competition law guidelines and anti antitrust. That applies to the questions that are submitted as well. We're very lucky we've got a, a broad range of speakers here today representing the different parts of the industry, uh, which is good news. And that's going to be very interesting. I'm looking forward to hearing their perspective on it. And last of all, we've got the uh, Q&A session. So now over to you, Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, thanks for the introduction and the uh, uh, setting up the agenda for us. Just uh, before uh, I start, uh, we are going to, IATA has been working for quite some time on the airline industry restart. We see three phases of the, of the recovery. First of all, uh, what's happening Im immediately, and this is what you see, uh, these days, uh, there are uh, a number of measures in, in place that uh, enable governments to approve flights. You've seen uh, flights are setting up. Uh, it's uh, the summer 
season also in the northern hemisphere so airlines are trying to uh, get advantage uh, uh, of this uh, situation as uh, tourism is trying to provide some type of economic activity to hard hit parts of, uh, of Europe especially and other parts of the world uh, so these uh, flights are flights are picking up uh, then we see an intermediate uh, phase with uh, various temporary arrangements uh, and uh, mutual acceptance between uh, different states that will go on for quite some time. Uh, we've seen uh, domestic uh, flights or short haul flights in, in the very beginning. And then uh, we hope to start seeing at the intermediate phase <clears throat> some of the long haul flights picking up. And then uh, past uh, 2022, we start. We will start seeing some of the temporary, the removal of the temporary arrangements that uh, are around it. So uh, in the next slide, you will see that IATA is uh, has set up about uh, uh, two aspects uh, on this, and uh, one is devoted to uh, one a big bucket that consists of two pillars. Uh, is devoted to the system restart and uh, the other pillar is devoted to the demand uh, restart so uh, within the system uh, restart uh, we have what we call uh, system capability so how we can get back uh, safely uh, the airplane safe uh, up in the in the sky that involves uh, most of our operational uh, requirements and also uh, issues with respect to travel experience ensure that all the necessary precautions are taken to avoid the spread of COVID-19 uh, within the industry. Uh, there is uh, IKEO uh, cards uh, that are devoted for uh, the airlines, for airports and other industry stakeholders. I encourage you to uh, get a hold and, and go through these documents. They're extremely helpful. And there's a long, uh, there's a list of, uh, of documents at the end of the presentation that will be provided to you uh, with all these links that will be helpful for you. Uh, with the, then we the, the second big uh, pillar is the demand uh, restart that is devoted to restoring the, the confidence so that different states can relax their travel restrictions and the public uh, feels confident to, to fly and uh, stimulating uh, this demand. What can we do? Uh, financial incentives or other type of incentives that we can keep uh, the air travel affordable for for the public and also getting the people on uh, on the planes back again uh, if i can have the next slide i'll uh, show you some of the uh, areas what uh, uh, iata has been working on these are again some links that you will not find at the end but we posted them for you here we have been working around the uh, maintenance burden for the parked aircraft, how we, we can optimize uh, maintenance tasks or escalate tasks or defer work just to just before the flight. Uh, we have published some guidance about the airworthiness of uh, the aircraft during and post the COVID pa pandemic. We have been working about the return to, to service. Uh, we have a manual about the aircraft cleaning and disinfection. Uh, the episode one uh, of uh, of this series is on the website. You can uh, uh, you can watch it li uh, online. We have uh, uh, the guidance and best practices for uh, traceability of uh, life of LLPs. We just introduced that, and we are going to have a webinar next week about the implementation of that. We we think that uh, used parts are going to be uh, a significant. Uh, element uh, for airlines to reduce costs moving forward and therefore we have been working on this uh, LLP trace traceability and also we have a service a unique tool that you can evaluate and trade uh, uh, use the serviceable material and the link is there and finally we have been working with uh, operators uh, and uh, manufacturers and of course the regulators uh, about uh, transporting uh, cargo mail uh, in the cabin uh, and with or without seats and uh, there are a number of uh, documents on this. So uh, with this I would like to uh, present you the first of all our, our panelists today. So we have uh, Eugenia Diaz-Alcazar 
uh, she's the Airworthiness Standards and Implementation Section Manager for EASA. Uh, today she's uh, representing us uh, uh, the regulator's viewpoint and what also EASA has, uh, EASA has been done in this area. Uh, just also to note that Eugenia sits, uh, she has one of the chair positions within the ICAO's airworthiness panel and she can talk to us about it. We have Aman Sandhu, uh, he's the 777 uh, Senior Deputy Fleet Chief uh, for the Boeing company. Uh, he will give us the uh, OEM uh, aspect uh, in, in this uh, uh, move forward in this uh, exercise and uh, Pat, Pat Markham with, uh, with Heiko, uh, he's the VP of technical services there. He will give us the viewpoint uh, as, as they have their own MRO and uh, also they're providing parts to the industry, the viewpoint from, from that side. And we have our two uh, experts that they participate in some of our industry groups, the engineering and maintenance group and the maintenance cost group. Uh, Yves Moran, who is the Director of uh, Engineering and Head of Airworthiness uh, uh, Engineering Organization for Air Canada, and Keith Fernandez, uh, who is the Manager for Fleet Engineering from uh, Virgin Australia. We try to cover all parts of the world and uh, these two guys are experts in this. They have been working on that for the last uh, few months uh, through this uh, pandemic. Before we go and I pass on to, uh, to Eugenia, for this, uh, we are going to have our, our first poll. Uh, so uh, we would like, we asked this question before and we would like to get your, the pulse of the, of the industry and of you attending this, uh, this webinar today. So when do you think that the demand for air travel will be back to the 2019 levels? Uh, so uh, if you can select uh, one of your, uh, choices either uh, six to 12 months 12 to 24 months two to three years or three years plus uh you have some selections there if you if i can allow you a few seconds to make your choice and then we'll uh, we'll review the results with you We had some interesting uh, expectations earlier. Let's see what uh, the people will say in this one. Okay, so uh, we have here that in most, the majority, about 50% of the people uh, are expecting the industry to go back uh, within two to three years. Uh, it's uh, really, uh, relatively long uh, recovery for the industry. Uh, thanks so much for responding to this, very, very interesting. And uh, with this, uh, I will uh, pass on to, uh, to Eugenia. Uh, she will give us the regulators and all, of course the YASA's uh, point of view on this. Thank you Eugenia for participating in this webinar. Thank you, all yours. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon from Cologne. Uh, first, allow me to thank Ayata for inviting EASA to this webinar. It is a pleasure and very happy to present on behalf of the agency some of the elements of our project on return to normal operations. Uh, the main objective of this uh, project is to support industry, support member states to ensure business continuity. Uh, for that reason and in the framework of this project, uh, we created several sub-streams to be sure that we were covering all the different actors, all the different domains. Here in the upper corner of the slide, you have the main sub-streams in a very schematic way. I will not go into detail because I really want to focus on, on things that are more relevant for this forum, but you can recognize here already the maintenance aspects, design, production, competent authorities in the EU. Um, something very important, we have a dedicated web page which link, as Chris was already mentioning, you will receive afterwards. Uh, within this link, you are invited 
to have an overview of the deliverables that the agency has been given publishing uh, under the framework of the return to normal operation. I will highlight that we took the lead in the guidelines for uh, transport of cargo in passengers aircraft to ensure goods entering the EU. And you will see their um, service information bulletins, um, operational directives, frequent asked questions, quite a broad uh, uh, type of documents that you can check. And finally, before going to the next uh, slide, uh, here in the lower part of the slide, you have the data given by Eurocontrol on the recovery of the operations until last week. Here you have the numbers. We are around 40% of the traffic compared to last year, and while well, the line on the curve is clearly increasing. Thank you. We can go for the next slide. Clearly, there is no compromise on safety. Because of that, we published the, the COVID-19 risk portfolio, uh, which is another important piece of information for you. This portfolio identifies the main risks due to this unprecedented situation. Uh, here you have an overall picture. Um, keep in mind that it is, these are the main categories identified. The risk portfolio really gives more details. Uh, more relevant to this forum, uh, let me highlight matters linked to human factors, competence of personnel, and in particular, quick storage and the storage of aircraft that might lead to technical failures. To this specific topic, I will refer, refer in the following slide, uh, because the agency, EASA, is working on a coming guideline on this topic to be published next Monday. Uh, the objective of this guideline is to raise awareness of possible hazards and risks on storage during COVID. What are the main elements here? Who is leading the project, the, the process? The process is led by what we call in the European system, CAMO, which is the Continuing Airworthiness Management Organization. This is the organization that has the knows the configuration of the aircraft and is responsible of uh, operating the aircraft airworthy. Obviously, not only the CAMO is the responsible on this, um, on this um, a specific um, assessment, uh, but other actors such as the maintenance organizations. Uh, for that, uh, we uh, give in the guidelines uh, two way forwards, two approaches, a proactive and a reactive approach. The proactive approach will be thinking ahead. How can this be done? We propose a number of questions that the organization can really try to answer. And here on the left side of the slide, you already have some examples. For example, enough protective covers were available for the fleet or because of the number, because of the volume, uh, they have to be used some alternative procedures. Or what was the last time that the CAMO or the maintenance organization used the procedures for return to service of the aircraft? or long-term storage. Is this procedure, because of the volume of aircraft that have been affected, still adequate for the current scenario? Again, this is the proactive approach. The reactive approach is based on the principle that an aircraft stored at the same time and the same environment are expected to behave in the same way. That means an, a maintenance organization performing maintenance and discovering some particular defects or unexpected findings can raise the information to make sure that aircraft in the same situation can be discovered these findings before. Coming now to the hazards and mitigating measures that the document will cover, first let me highlight that it is not exhaustive list uh, the CAMO has to make the exercise on their specific needs and their specific activities. It is very important. These are examples. Uh, again, because of time, I will not go through all of them. You have here just a picture of some of them. Uh, but to give you the flavor, allow me to go, for example, on the first case, aircraft not or not fully stored in accordance with the storage procedures, as you can see in the upper side of the slide. 
So for this specific hazard, the some possible mitigating measures could be group aircraft from the same tribe and stored on the same conditions and consider some additional sample checks, maintenance sample checks. Depending on the findings, these sample checks can be increased. And always report unexpected findings to the TC holder, to the competent authority, to EASA, to contribute that the TC holder has all the information to enhance the recommended practices. Another interesting topic, and then I will just finalize my presentation, could be inappropriate decision making in a known situation because this is, has been so unexpected that it can be the case that the procedures are not really um, giving a good answer to the, to the problems. Possible mitigating measures remind all staff to report problems or unknown situations. It is important that they don't act on their own. To have a dedicated team on very knowledgeable and experienced um, staff for decision making and review guidance or publish recommendations. Um, as a key message of these guidelines, I have two words, is awareness, there are risks, only compliance is not enough, we have to really look forward, we, we have to make this proactive approach to look for possible things that could be happening, and second, communication, communication is essential between the different actors and organizations. And that's all from my side. Thank you, and I will be available for your questions later on. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Eugenia. And uh, with this, I will uh, pass it on to Aman Sandu from the Boeing Company. Aman, all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, first off, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, this is Aman Sandu, as Chris said, from Boeing Customer Support. Um, I really hope everyone, along with your families, you're doing well and staying safe. And uh, thanks to IATA for uh, inviting Boeing to be part of the panel today. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to start by uh, talking a little bit about how we, Boeing as a company, reacted to this unprecedented time, uh, maybe some of the challenges, and what actions did we take to help our uh, operator partners here. Um, First off, like everyone else, uh, we had to quickly react and change our operating rhythm. And by that, what I mean is, you know, our customer engagements and uh, the regular technical content that we bring in with the customers, we had to kind of quickly repurpose to the need of the hour, which was, you know, storing airplanes or cleaning or the cargo carriage. Um, with that, it became really important that we had a single source of consistent information flowing out to our operator partners and to the industry. Uh, and we've utilized our multi-operator messages, some of the initiatives that we've been part of. Um, we've been pretty consistent in making sure that that information is available as we kind of work through these problems. Um, another aspect which is actually even more important is to make sure that we're connected. And so we've hosted multiple calls with uh, all, the, all the model operators or specific models to get your feedback to, uh, first off, uh, make sure that there's a common understanding on what we are uh, putting out to the public and then getting your feedback if that's value added to understand your pain points and quickly react to that. Um, and that's been uh, going on very successfully since the past three months we've hosted uh, multiple calls uh, and uh, re regarding all models and specific models as well. Um, Obviously, we've been part of industry uh, groups, industry committees in the last two to three months. We've seen a lot of industry committees, a lot of action, uh, you know, on this um, present time and the current environment. Uh, so we've been involved with ICAO, ICCIA, IATA, A4A, and other regulatory agencies as well. And as we were kind of progressing through that, uh, we launched our Confident Travel Initiative. And a lot of you have received information earlier through uh, either ICAO and then through the Confident Travel Initiative website. And our counterparts have also launched similar initiatives. And what we've done is we've partnered through ICCAIA uh, on, on a lot of these um, uh, topics and made sure that we collaborate and uh, work together to kind of work through the need of the hour. Uh, and lastly, it's, it's really important to make sure that uh, we uh, keep reacting, we react fast, we take a proactive approach. Uh, as you know, things are still evolving, it's still pretty volatile. 
So we're trying to make sure that we uh, provide you updates and revisions, and we do so uh, very quickly, uh, depending on the industry needs. Um, so that was, uh, you know, a little bit of a flavor of Boeing's response uh, in the last two, three months, what we've been going and what we've been focusing on. Um, if you can go to the next slide, I'll uh, touch upon uh, the three main focus areas uh, that most of us have been working in the past two to three months. I think you're more or less aware of every single one of them. So what I'm going to uh, attempt today is to highlight a few elements in each and every category and maybe give you a little bit of uh, recent updates that have just kind of come along in the past couple of weeks. So as we start with aircraft maintenance, uh, you know, the storage is a big aspect. And um, the, the terminologies are very similar across the OEMs, but we talk about normal, active, and prolonged. For normal, it's a turnkey operation. You basically park your airplane for seven days. Uh, you don't have any specific maintenance tasks. Uh, we've extended the normal operation from seven to 14 days. We provided some guidelines there. Uh, for active storage, which is again, the airplane is um, in flight ready condition and can return to service in a very short span of time. Pre-COVID for uh, quite a few models, we only had a 90 day active storage. Since then, we've gone from 90 to 120 to 180 days, uh, providing operators more flexibility to keep their airplanes in active storage so they can return back um, you know, on a short notice whenever that happens. Uh, and then lastly, prolonged storage where, you know, you basically put your critical um, uh, parts and you preserve them. Uh, RTS in this case requires a significant level of effort. Um, we have issued a multi-operator message, actually quite a few, uh, basically providing recommendations if you want to transition from active to prolonged storage. Uh, the second aspect on the maintenance side is your um, calendar-driven uh, maintenance, line maintenance tasks. Uh, and what we've done is for all the models, we've assessed the SMTs uh, for interval extensions to provide operators more flexibility. And for all the models, we have service letters out, uh, basically giving those recommendations on the assessments. Uh, one thing to note here is the assessments uh, exclude uh, life limited parts, uh, AWLs, CMRs, and uh, um, airworthiness directives if there are any against some of the maintenance tasks. Uh, but the intention here is to give you a recommendation on the tasks that uh, we feel can be extended. Uh, obviously, the obligation is with the operator to go and get that extension approved by their regulator. But having a service letter out with our recommendations, we really hope that that would expedite things for you. And lastly, on that topic, um, as you all are aware, uh, many times there is a one-to-one -one direct correlation between our SMTs and the AMM tasks uh, in the storage operation. So while you're in storage, if you perform the AMM task, which has a direct relation with the line maintenance task, uh, you will get credit for that so that you don't have to go do that task all over again. So hopefully that will give you some level of flexibility. Um, moving to the next major focus area, uh, cleaning and disinfecting. Um, just like to note, uh, last Friday, we released the version eight of our multi-operator message, which covers all these elements here. So you can get all the details. I'll touch upon a couple of highlights from a chemical disinfectant standpoint. We've got about seven cleaners approved. Uh, in the latest mom, we have a cabin cleaning map. We've separa separated some uh, elements uh, from a flight deck, passenger cabin, cargo compartment standpoint so that it's much more easy to read and kind of follow those guidelines. Um, from an um, antimicrobial surface standpoint, um, we've evaluated a lot of uh, commercial off-the-shelf uh, products. Um, there has been some uh, corrosion concerns, but we have uh, recommended uh, two products, which are mentioned in our latest uh, MOM, and we've provided an NTO on both these products and we continue to evaluate further products in this arena. From a UV technology standpoint, uh, again, we uh, have been studying different wavelengths and we recently provided an NTO for the 254 uh, nanometer uh, UV disinfection to be used on the flight deck area. 
with the exception of uh, not using it on windows and seat belts. Uh, and we're also in the process of investigating the 222 uh, nanometer band as well. Uh, from an ECS standpoint, uh, ion generation, we're still investigating that, whether that could be a ground operation or a ground equipment, or maybe installing in the ECS system. Uh, there has been concern about ozone generation and that can uh, react with the cabin surfaces and uh, which would result in uh, in aging of the surfaces and the finishes. Um, also because the air within the cabin exchanges uh, very rapidly, which limits the amount of ions to stay within the cabin, we're still evaluating the effectiveness. And then lastly, you know, there are journal issues and application methods. So if you refer to the latest mom, you'll see that we've got uh, an NTO out on uh, electrostatic sprayer or MISTER operation. Uh, one thing of note is uh, please make sure that the airplane is depowered if you choose to use uh, an electrostatic mister. Uh, and we want to make sure that these chemicals are not ingested into the ECS system. Uh, and lastly on that, um, we have uh, some guidance and I would really recommend that you go through the MOM on fogging. Uh, and if an operator chooses to do so, I would highly recommend you go through the MOM. We have a few concerns uh, listed out there, uh, along with uh, the usage of the recirculation fans, if you go through that. Uh, moving on to the last category, which is, uh, again, has been a, a really big demand of cargo um, carriage in a passenger cabin. Um, I'll, I'll basically touch the highlights on the lower cargo compartments. We already had provided approval early. Uh, passenger compartment, there were some, recomm some recommendations and guidelines along with an NTO uh, for approved storage within the cabin, which was under the seats or the stowage locations. Um, we had released a mom early May 6th for additional opportunities, which is basically removing seats in the in the main cabin and uh, allowing cargo storage there. Uh, it was basically the, the, the book and seat concept where we had recommended uh, you can remove four rows of seats and then keep one row to make sure that um, uh, prohibit cargo or maybe the one row of seat acts as a cargo barrier to uh, uh, prohibit any movement of cargo. Um, I would like to note that the FA has come out with a second exemption recently. Uh, which covers uh, not only the cargo carriage on seats, but also on floor. Uh, they are in alignment with the mom we had issued. Uh, and uh, they are not prohibiting removing all the seats from the airplane, but you will have to go show uh, additional analysis if you go choose to do so. If you're aligned with the Boeing mom, uh, there is, um, uh, it is likely that they will not question uh, the analysis or if, the, if you follow the recommendations uh, for the OEM guidance. And lastly, before I uh, end my part of the presentation, uh, BGS, Boeing Technical uh, Consulting, there is an agreement in place. If you choose to make certain modifications, you can definitely reach out to our BGS team and they would be more than happy to help out. Uh, with that, I'll pass it back to Chris and uh, I'll take questions in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Aman. And uh, let's move on with uh, uh, Pat Markham from, from the HICO company. Pat. Thank you, Chris. Uh, <clears throat> and thank you, Ayata, for asking me to join today. Um, like Aman said, uh, we hope that everybody is safe and healthy. Um, and keeping themselves healthy because we'd all like to get back to flying again. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that, that Chris mentioned uh, earlier in the introduction was um, you know, we, we are taking a look at uh, what's happening in the industry from a maintenance and a, a parts manufacturing perspective. Um, the worldwide fleet disruptions um, have caused a, a ripple of disruptions on the demand side through the supply chain. So um, if you think about all of the maintenance and all of the cadence of work of getting parts prepared uh, for the maintenance, uh, getting the people ready to do the maintenance, having the tools, etc., everything is set up for or was set up for the pre-COVID-19 um, uh, workflow that was happening. <clears throat> so 
as the, the fleet started to, to be grounded and the, the flights were disrupted, um, all of that supply chain needed to readjust itself and rebalance. Um, and so that, that's one of the first steps is to go and say, all right, step back and figure out where we're going to go. And then the next big question is, when you have return to service, which fleets and when? Um, because the, the rest of the supply chain is all looking at <clears throat> how do we make sure we prepare ourselves for when the aircraft start flying again, that we can be in position to um, to take care of that, to do that maintenance um, and, and get there. So for HICO, can you click over, Jared Bean? Um, for HICO, the important thing here is to make sure that we stay agile and we keep connected because it's so important to understand what the airlines are planning to do, um, even when the airlines don't know what they're planning to do. Um, so uh, my, my plea to the airlines is please make sure you talk to your supply chain, even if you don't know what you're going to be doing, if you have an idea, if you have an idea and you say, I think it's going to be this, but it's a 20% probability it's going to change again, or 80% probability it's going to change again, let the supply chain know, because we can start to work on how do we re-engage, how do we make sure that we have the right parts at the right time, um, because there will be disruptions. Uh, at HICO, we've, we've stayed open. Um, we've continued to do maintenance, uh, again, adjusting for what people are asking for. We continue to produce parts. Um, and we really lean on our people. Um, you know, they, the quality, the safety, that's uh, that's un, unchanged. There's nothing that's going to happen there that, that will change anything. Um, the people, how do we become innovative? How do we make sure that we continue to operate and function in this COVID-19 era? Um, you know, very quickly, how do we go and, and get face shields in place? How do we go and protect the people? And how do we make sure that we continue the operations in, in the proper way? Um, and also making sure that all the inspections are being done. To, we staggered shifts to make sure that we could do the inspections with, that, with keeping social distancing, et cetera. So there's a lot of work that went into making sure we can keep operations going, keeping agile, and making sure we're doing the right things for the airlines. <clears throat> Click ahead. So looking forward um, and leaning forward. So we've all been through these fleet disruptions before. Um, I look back at my career and you've got 9-11, uh, you've got the 2008-2009 Great Recession. Um, all of those had significant fleet disruptions. Uh, you had fleets that went away and really never came back. Um, so really, it's something that we've dealt with before, we know how to do. Um, and while this is sharper um, and quicker, and deeper than before. Um, we hope it's going to come back. Uh, I'm hoping that it'll be back before the two to three years that we talked about. Um, <clears throat> but it's it's really a process we've been through and it's about inventory planning and replanning um, because everything that was planned uh, pre-COVID-19 now needs to be replanned and we need to figure out what we're doing again, which is why the communication with your, your supply chain is really important. Um, we're also continuing to develop new PMAs and DERs because we know that um, some of the new fleets will re-engage first, um, and we need to make sure that we're there and ready and available uh, for when those fleets return to service and they start to have maintenance occur on them, that we can go and be, be prepared and be ready. Um, and one of the interesting things has been, um, while the airlines have been taking a pause from the operation, um, it's allowed some of the people to look at some of those things that are important but not urgent, um, in terms of the daily flying operation to say, can we develop our alternate parts plan? Um, how do we make sure that we come out of this uh, COVID-19 crisis as a stronger airline? <clears throat> and so part of that is looking at how do you approve alternate parts? What's that process? So it was interesting. We had uh, several airlines that were not actively flying much, um, but were actually looking at how do I position myself to save maintenance costs on a go forward basis? So we, we killed a lot of questions from people that we hadn't expected uh, during this time frame. And so we're, um, I'm positive uh, in looking forward that saying that, that these airlines are being proactive to make sure that when we do return to the new normal operation, um, that we'll be in a better position. <clears throat> um, and lastly, uh, here is to make sure that uh, when you do return to service, um, that you do have a second source. There will be supply chain disruptions. Um, as we get back into to normal operation, because 
Um, you know, we are looking forward. We're trying to figure out what you're going to be consuming. Um, the, the manufacturers, the OEMs are doing the same thing. So there will be issues. So if you can make sure that you have a second source option, it's going to make sure that you're more easily um, able to go and get back uh, into service quickly. Can you click one more time, Geraldine? I think uh, this is one of the things that, that struck me um, relatively early on is we have all been through this before. Um, and when it seems like everything is going against you, remember that uh, we're in the air, aircraft industry, the airplanes take off into the wind, uh, not with it. So, you know, th this is a time where we can go and figure out how to be stronger, how to be better, how to be better prepared for return to service. Um, and I, I think we will get through this all together and we'll be coming out the other end. Maybe maybe we won't look all the same, but uh, you know, we, the, the aerospace industry, are a key integral part to um, the world that we live in. So uh, I'm looking forward to, to getting back into flying again and, and getting out to see new people in, in person as opposed to just on a, on a WebEx. So and I'm happy to go and take questions at the end as well. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, thank you, Pat. And uh, with this, let's uh, move on with uh, Yves Moran and uh, uh, with uh, his uh, Air Canada experience. Also, just for you guys, uh, Yves is uh, our uh, chairman for the engineering and maintenance group at IATA. Thanks, Yves, for participating. All yours. I think you are muted, Yves. Sorry about that. Let me start again. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, glad to be part of this webinar and uh, the ability to share our parking and storage experience uh, as Air Canada. Uh, next slide, please. So the first thing we did, uh, because this was so sudden, is we created a dedicated uh, working group uh, for parking and storage uh, because of the complexity uh, of this and also because we're more in the business of flying aircraft and not necessarily parking them. Uh, what you're seeing on the top right of the slide is uh, what we call fleet storage guidance because we were work working with different OEMs, different terminology, different approach. Uh, we have to sort this out for our maintenance and planning uh, team. And that's what the first thing the working group did. And, and you see the different task cards uh, for the seven days, 14 days, 30 days, et cetera, and even the return to service. So that made things a lot easier and simpler for our planning and maintenance group. Uh, and you see covers, covers, covers. Yes, that was the very first thing we, all the airlines were trying to get uh, covers, engine covers, uh, exhaust covers, covers for the probes, et cetera. Uh, so we had some in stock, but not to, not for the uh, number of aircraft we were going to park. Uh, so we ended up working with a local uh, provider to address this. And because we had aircraft, mostly in North America, but in different locations, uh, we had to customize our program. And what you're seeing also on this slide is the what's called the caution severity zones, and it's based on the advisory circular from the FAA. So we had to adapt the program depending on the location of these aircraft. If they were in high humidity zones, we kept the aircraft on active uh, parking program, uh, running the engines more frequently, uh, doing loop tasks, uh, things like that. And throughout the entire uh, program, and it is still going on, uh, we have our air wilderness group that's auditing on a regular basis the different uh, aircraft, different locations. And, uh, and everything, every time there's a defect, uh, it's identified and addressed uh, promptly. Uh, some of the findings uh, we've had, uh, we had uh, sticky pneumatic valves. Uh, we had some uh, engine lipkin uh, sites of corrosion. Uh, we also had initially some uh, corrosion due to moisture ingress on some of the probes. Uh, so those were addressed. Uh, go to the next slide, please. So the return to service obviously uh, is, is key for us. About half of our fleet is back into service. And our approach was to group it in, in four categories. Uh, the operational aircraft, we kept a small number of aircraft operational uh, in the past a few months. Uh, we kept also some in a 
ready to fly uh, status with the short term parking, uh, long term storage, obviously, for those that will take more time to return. And we also uh, took the opportunity to retire some of our legacy fleets. Uh, so, depending on that, uh, we adjusted our return to service procedure. Um, what we did is uh, to make sure there's no duplicate. We look at the uh, our current maintenance program, our current task cards, and every time uh, we saw the same thing in the return to service a package, we sort of combined this to optimize this. Uh, but we're still talking days, anywhere from two to five days, depending on the uh, extent of, of the return to service. It is uh, quite comprehensive. Uh, it's going to take some time, uh, but as I said, for us, by having a dedicated uh, working group, uh, that paid off. And uh, so that's that's our experience, and um, I'll be available for questions at the end. So back to you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eve. Uh, and uh, with this, we turn over to Keith from Down Under. Uh, thanks for staying so late uh, with us, uh, Keith. And uh, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And good evening, everyone from Brisbane. Uh, can you have the next slide, please? Just yeah. Yeah, here, are some, here are a few elements for managing continuing airworthiness. Uh, that will enable you to preserve your certificate of airworthiness. At the same time, protect your valuable assets from environmental deterioration, from damage, etc. As you enter your aircraft into parking or storage programs in accordance with instructions for continuing airworthiness, and approve deviations from which you can get those from the OEM. For example, items like material non-availability or inability to comply with certain instructions in the in the maintenance manuals and the OEMs have certainly been very forthcoming in supporting the operators at these times. Uh, as Yes had mentioned before and our experience is that it is really good to have a full risk assessment done on your complete parking program as well as your return to service uh, which will give you the opportunity to put controls in place to manage those risks to an acceptable level. As part of managing continuing airworthiness as well, there will be program adjustments that you will do along the way. Some of them adjusting your program to local conditions or environmental conditions, uh, depending on your location. For example, if you're parked close to the ocean or you're parked in an area where you have high humidity or high moisture content, and you may take the opportunity to protect your exposed bare metal with uh, deviations such as CIC applications, uh, in terms of additional maintenance, uh, that also forms part of your program adjustments. So ICA changes in the form of uh, AMM changes or temp revisions that, are, that should be monitored and managed as part of your additional maintenance, as well as OEM program extensions. When the programs were extended from 90 days to 180 days, that came with a lot of additional maintenance, which needs to be which needs to be uh, done in order to maintain your continuing airworthiness. And in terms of repeat inspections, these should be done in a timely manner as well as consistently. It will give you the opportunity to manage your defects effectively. For example, to prevent these defects from manifesting or even uh, deteriorating further during your parking programs. For example, is the corrosion on the lip skin of the 7B engine as well as sightings of birds and insect nests uh, in unsealed areas, unsealed cavities that enable you to effectively manage your defects. Engine and APU runs, these should be done more often than recommended in the maintenance manuals. It will give you that opportunity to get your air conditioning and recirculation systems going, ventilate your cabin and manage your relative humidity. Fuel treatments, if you are using biocide, do adhere strictly to the ratios and processes in the maintenance manuals, as well as whether you're using biocide or not. Testing frequency frequently is definitely recommended to keep that microbiological growth uh, well within, uh, to keep that contained and keep the growth within limits as well. Next slide, please. So optimizing your return to service generally can be done over three platforms of work. The first one is scheduled maintenance. So you quit your accumulated scheduled maintenance. Deviations to extend maintenance, for example, your calendar task that you're looking at extending 
past your parking programs or even uh, after your return to service. If you're going to go down that pathway, you're going to need OEM technical justification to support that uh, prior to getting your regulatory approvals. Mandatory ICA, so any of the mandatory documents that are published during your parking period. For example, the recently published FAA AD on the 777, that's the refueling door cycling procedure that is effective on the 18th of July. Auto parking maintenance, so that's your standard parking instructions in accordance with the AMMs, getting that out of service and following those instructions. Open defects, any defects that you've been carrying on the aircraft during your parking period or those that are manifested during as part of repeat inspections. Rock parts, so parts that have been taken off an aircraft to service other airplanes as well during the parking program, as well as loadable software, so map database, terrain database, any of those software updates that need to be updated on the aircraft prior to return to service. And finally, as part of the operator driven, these are some of our own operator driven tasks. I'm sure you, through your experience and through your returning your airplanes to service, you'll have, you could ask to this list. But we put an emphasis on extensive flight tech checks, especially the electrical and av avionics systems, with a big emphasis on the alternate and standby systems as well. Part power runs, so getting those engines up to about 80% of power, giving you the opportunity to test your police systems as well as the engine cowl anti-ice systems. And finally, getting your, car your cabin ready, cosmetically ready for return of your passengers, getting your deep cleans done, disinfectants, carpets, furnishings, galley equipment, checking your water boilers and ovens, etc., your lavatories, as well as your emergency equipment, your documentation, and uh, just making sure that you're ready for return to service in an optimized way. I'll take your questions if there's time left at the end, but for now, thank you for listening and back to you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Keith. Uh, we'll move on uh, uh, in, a, in, in a minute to our uh, Q&A session. Uh, thanks uh, to all of you guys who participated in this. We're running a little bit late. Before we go to the Q&A, uh, please uh, uh, go ahead with uh, our second uh, poll. Uh, that is about what is your main maintenance-related issue preparing for RTS for, for the return to service? either coping with uh, regulatory and OEM maintenance requirements, the availability of tools and facilities to do heavy maintenance tasks that have been due, uh, the availability of uh, technical staff, uh, aircraft cleaning requirements to meet uh, the turnaround times uh, at, uh, when, when the industry restarts uh, as, as we come back. So you just have a few, about 30 seconds to respond to this before we see the answers to the poll. So you have a few uh, selected options there. And there's the result. So the most important one, it is uh, actually more than 50% of you think that uh, coping with uh, regulatory and OEM maintenance requirements is the is the main uh, is the most important uh, relate uh, maintenance related issue. The availability is not as important. However, a lot of you have concerns about the availability of technical tasks to to do these. Uh, uh, these tasks returning to service. So thank you for your uh, responses in the uh, webinar. When you get the link, you will see how you compare with uh, the first webinar. Uh, thank you very much. And we have just a few minutes for some Q&A. Uh, there are a few questions, actually a lot of questions that came in uh, either before or uh, during the, uh, the presentation, the webinar. Uh, we'll go with uh, uh, one that applies to uh, pretty much uh, everyone on the call. Uh, do panel members, and this is to all of you uh, guys on the panel, think that every exemption, vari variation, deviation that is applied to the maintenance requirements, both um, RBR or MPD tasks as well the AMM storage tasks, 
the risk related to those uh, should be assessed by the operators as well as the regulatory authorities. Uh, what maybe we'll we'll start with uh, with Keith on this one. Uh, what do you think, Keith? Uh, do you think that every uh, exemption has to be uh, risk assessed by the operators? So every every uh, every one of the tasks coming in definitely went to risk assessment in terms of manual requirements, material availability. But to answer your question directly, we did not go to the regulatory authorities because they came in in the form of instructions for continuing airworthiness, and those are what we use to comply with the requirements. So they either came into the AMM or they came in initially through a MOM and then to a temporary revision or, or the AMM. But we did our own risk assessment and did a full assessment before we implemented the task, but we did not go to the regulatory authorities. Thank you, Keith. Uh, if you you have anything else to add to Keith's uh, explanation? Maybe you are muted, Keith. Uh, Eve. Maybe we'll. Uh, we cannot hear you. Eve. Maybe we'll pass on with uh, Aman. Uh, do you think that uh, everything has to go? Uh... Uh, you know, uh, Chris, that's a that's a good question. And you know, part of uh, what the OEMs do, we we've, we've assessed those as I mentioned before. Uh, but what I would say is, operator feedback is key. You know, that kind of helps us do better and understand some of your pain points. The example I would take is the the engine runs. I think there was. Uh, significant feedback from the operators to take it from 14 days to 30 days. And, and sometimes, uh, you know, that operator feedback is key for us to kind of go, um, you know, when we discuss with the regulators as well. Uh, but I think we've done more more of the assessment. It, it, it is basically uh, up to the OEMs and the regulators to do. Uh, but the operator feedback is definitely key and uh, makes us do our job even better. So that's my put. Thank you, Aman. Uh, Eugenia, do you have to add anything to any of the previous comments as from the regulatory side? Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, if I understood well the question, we are talking about um, instructions for maintenance that are coming from the TC holder. Uh, obviously, a risk assessment uh, because of the current circumstances, uh, yes, um, that's basically what I've been trying to defend uh, in, the, in the guidelines I've been talking about before, but they are maintenance instructions. If I, Again, if I answered well the question, they should be treated like that. Um, I don't see right now a need unless it is under a certification process, which is a bit different, uh, to have by special uh, acceptance from the competent authority, except it is an exemption, again, talking about the certification processes. Uh, and uh, I think there was one very important and key element here is that the communication uh, operators, CAMOS, uh, providing feedback, uh, maintenance organizations providing feedback of the defects is key. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eugenia. We have one uh, uh, <clears throat> last uh, question. We are running out of time. After return to operation, and this is mostly, I guess, from, from Aman, from the OEM, uh, after return to operation, most of the airplanes are flying less than their normal utilization. Because of the lower utilization, will there be any regulation to force the manufacturers to revise the maintenance requirements to include calendar time intervals? Uh, that, that's one thing uh, we've looked at. We've had a, a couple of revisions, as you've seen, but I would say at this point, um, uh, we're still working on it. There's no definitive answer, I'm sorry, I can give you uh, on calendar maintenance. Uh, we will definitely assess the situation as things get back to the old normal and what does our utilization look like at that standpoint, uh, but definitely something that we can uh, consider when the time comes. I think it's a little bit um, uh, early for us to kind of go give you a definitive answer on that. 
but definitely worth considering. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aman. We are running out of time, but if we can quickly flip over the last uh, few slides, uh, Geraldine. Uh, so uh, these are the links that you are going to have uh, at our own ayata.org. We have uh, 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 in the main page, there are a lot of useful links for you uh, related to some of the activities you perform uh, within the airline. And in the next slide, you will see uh, a number of uh, the, the IASA uh, website and also the IKEO uh, sites that include a number of uh, worldwide applications. Mainly it applies to uh, the regulatory authorities. However, there's a lot of useful information there and I highly recommend that you join. And in the next uh, slide, please, uh, you have a, a also a very wide, broad type of information from, from IASA, as Eugenia mentioned earlier. Uh, feel free to browse around uh, a lot of uh, good stuff for you uh, as you restart the operation, uh, you return to normal operations. And the, on the last one, uh, it's the upcoming, as uh, Eugenia mentioned, publication on continuing airworthiness uh, of the aircraft. Uh, it's gonna be published uh, from uh, IASA in the next uh, few days. So uh, look, we look forward uh, to this uh, as it will be another useful tool uh, moving forward. And uh, uh, I think this was the last slide. I would like to thank you all for attending our panelists. Some of you uh, woke up very early in the morning. Some of you stayed up uh, late into the night and we appreciate it, but we wanted to have one call to cover all parts of the, of the world. We greatly appreciate your attendance and your contributions. We'll, uh, uh, we'll try to reply to all your questions and the presentation and the slides will be available uh, soon on the, on the IATA website through an email message. Thanks again for uh, attending. Bye-bye uh, for now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you.